on World News Tonight. Brutal attacks. Russia has sunk to a new low as Ukraine accuses the country of bombing children's hospitals and other vulnerable groups in its military pursuit of Ukraine, prompting outrage across the globe. Aiding Ukraine. The United Kingdom has joined the effort of lending stranded Ukrainians a helping hand, planning a drop in visa restrictions to assist a better means of setting down away from the war-torn country. Rising tolls. Hong Kong suffers even larger waves of COVID infections causing skyrocketing numbers of deaths and straining the medical sector. The government readies to fight with the means of mass testing. And Carnival Fun. Rio readies to be bathed in colour chaos in preparation for its iconic carnival season. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Our top stories today still leads with the Ukraine crisis. The situation in Ukraine is more dire now than ever as Ukraine has reported that Russia has bombed a children's hospital in Mariupol city, causing numerous casualties including young children, causing mass outrage across the globe. Ukraine on Wednesday said a Russian airstrike badly damaged a children's hospital in the besieged city of Mariupol, burying patients under rubble and injuring women in labor. Video shot by the Ukraine military of what appeared to be the badly damaged children's and maternity hospital showed the wreckage of a three-story building. Piles of rubble and burnt-out cars were seen smoldering outside, and wounded people were carried from the destruction. Video posted on Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky's Instagram account showed the hospital interior piled with debris from broken windows, walls and equipment. The bombing, which Zelensky called an atrocity, took place despite an agreed ceasefire to enable thousands of civilians trapped in the city to escape. The Kremlin denies targeting civilians. The White House condemned the assault. Press Secretary Jen Psaki. It is horrifying to see the type of um, the barbaric use of military um, force um, to go after innocent civilians in a sovereign country. Ukraine said 67 children across the country had been killed since the invasion and more than a thousand civilians had died in Mariupol. It was not possible to independently verify the figures. More than two million people have fled Ukraine since Russian President Vladimir Putin launched the invasion on February 24th. Ukraine continues to call for allies to imply a no-fly zone, but NATO has declined that request, fearing it could escalate the war. And on Wednesday, the Pentagon closed the door on Poland's proposal to put its MiG-29 fighter jets at the disposal of a U.S. military base in Germany in response to Ukraine's call for fighter jets. Pentagon spokesman John Kirby said the plan was not tenable. The intelligence community has assessed that the transfer of MiG-29s to Ukraine may be mistaken as escalatory and could result in a significant Russian reaction that might increase the prospects of a military escalation with NATO. Moscow says its demands, including that Kyiv takes a neutral position and drops aspirations of joining the NATO alliance, must be met for it to end its assault. More countries are joining in on backing Russia into a corner. Canada has also announced that the halting of the Nord Stream 2 project was indeed the best possible decision in response to the Russian-Ukraine conflict. Let's cross over to Abu Dharana World News Special Correspondent Joshua Samaranaika, who joins us now from Ontario in Canada. For more, Joshua. Yes, Shirali. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said that the decision to halt the certification of the Russian pipeline project Nord Stream 2 was the right one to counter Russia's intimidation of Europe. He also said Russian President Vladimir Putin was attacking the values that form the pillars of all democracies. Trudeau said at an event in Berlin organized by the transatlantic think tank Atlantic Bridge and the Munich Security Conference that this kind of brazen disregard for law and human life is a massive threat to Europe and to the world. Trudeau also underlined the importance of democracies working together in unity to fight authoritarian regimes. Speaking at a joint news conference with Germany's Councillor Olaf Scholz earlier, Trudeau said his country was sending an extra $39 million worth of equipment to Ukraine, including cameras used in drones. Scholz and Trudeau said that they had discussed energy cooperation both in light of climate targets and the Ukraine crisis, which has highlighted Europe's and particularly Germany's dependence on oil and gas imports from Russia. 
Canada is one of the fourth largest oil producer and sixth largest natural gas producer. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adi Darana World News Special Correspondent Joshua Samranayake reporting from Ontario in Canada. Despite Nord Stream 2's closure, Germany and Hungary rejected energy sanctions on Russia, while the United States and Britain announced that they had stopped importing energy from Russia. We have Adi Darana World News Special Correspondent Inuka Ponzo who reports from Cleve in Germany. For more, Inuka. Yes, Shanali. Germany would not ban energy imports from Russia, said German Foreign Minister Annalena Bauerbock. Every year, one third of Germany's petroleum and over half of its natural gas are supplied by Russia. The whole country would come to a halt without energy from Russia, according to Bauerbock. Energy imports from Russia is of essential importance for general services and citizens' daily life, as there is currently no other way of securing Europe's supply of energy for heating, mobility, power supply and industry, said German Chancellor Olaf Scholz in a statement. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban said that he would not make Hungarian families to pay the price of war and he refused to expand sanctions on Russia to oil and gas imports. Without energy supply from Russia, Hungary's economy can hardly move on, said the Prime Minister. The pressure brought by sanctions has also been felt by France. French Economy and Finance Minister Bruno Le Maire on Wednesday warned the surge in energy prices is comparable to the oil shock in 1973 that led to stagflation. Russia, the world's main oil exporter, has been exporting some 7 million barrels of crude oil to the global market every day. Back to you, Shanali. Thank you, and that was Adi Darana World News Special Correspondent Inuka Ponzo reporting from Cleve in Germany. Meanwhile, to aid those stranded following the invasion of the UK government said that it was setting up a visa centre for Ukrainian refugees in northern France after anger that some were being turned away. Ukrainian families arrive at their emergency accommodation in Calais in northern France. While the EU has granted temporary residency to those fleeing the war, refugees who wish to cross the English Channel have been told they must have a valid visa upon arrival in the UK and family members who are already there. They're also being told they must go to Paris or Brussels to apply. Authorities in Calais say hundreds of Ukrainians have been turned away by British border agents. Accused of dragging its feet, the British government is facing mounting criticism over its response, including calls from some of its own MPs to ease visa restrictions. It says it's now setting up a processing centre more than 100 kilometres from Calais. The Home Secretary has announced a new pop-up application site in Lille. Britain is insisting that security checks still need to be carried out, but France says its policies show a lack of humanity. Calais is no stranger to Franco-British tensions over the management of migration flows. The port has long been a departure point for those trying to reach the UK via trucks and inflatable dinghies. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. In the 2022 presidential race in South Korea, one candidate has a clear lead according to the National Election Commission, and that is Yoon So Kyol of the main opposition People Power Party. The former prosecutor general was in a neck and neck race throughout the ruling Democratic Party's Lee Jae Myung when slightly more than half the ballots were counted nationwide. Finally, Yoon clinched a razor thin lead. South Korea has a new president. Conservative opposition candidate Yoon suk yeol was elected in one of the most closely fought races in recent history, which will shape Asia's fourth largest economy for the next five years. Yoon, who is 60, edged out the ruling Democratic Party's Lee Jae-myung by a fraction. A formal announcement is expected to be made on Thursday. The People Power Party candidate said he would work with opposition parties to heal polarized politics and foster national unity, calling the election a, quote, victory of the great people. Yoon's five-year term will begin this month to replace incumbent President Moon Jae-in, who is constitutionally barred from seeking re-election. The White House congratulated Yoon, saying President Joe Biden looked forward to working closely with him to bolster the alliance. 
Despite being a political novice, Yoon shot to fame after spearheading high-profile investigations into corruption scandals engulfing Moon's aides. We have to stop the corrupt and incompetent ruling force's attempt to extend their term and plunder people. He has pledged to stamp out graft, foster justice, and create a more level playing field while seeking a reset with China and a tougher stance towards reclusive North Korea. More than 77 percent of South Korea's 44 million eligible voters cast ballots to pick their next leader, despite an unprecedented surge in new COVID-19 cases, with a record 342,446 posted on Wednesday. North Korea is now on the watch, it seems. The country has decided to launch Renaissance satellites, which will essentially monitor key global superpowers, which include the United States and its allies. North Korea says it will launch satellites to monitor the U.S. and its allies in the years ahead, according to state media on Thursday. Leader Kim Jong-un said a lot of military reconnaissance satellites would be put into orbit as part of a five-year plan announced in 2021. State media KCNA reported that Kim inspected the country's space agency this week and that Kim noted, quote, The purpose of developing and operating the military reconnaissance satellite is to provide the armed forces of the DPRK with real-time information on military actions against it by the aggression troops of the U.S. imperialism and its forces in South Korea, Japan, and the Pacific. The move may prove as controversial as the country's nuclear armed weapons tests because experts say the satellite uses the same ballistic missile technology banned by the UN Security Council. Pyongyang said it's conducted two satellite systems tests over the last two months. The launches drew international condemnation, and US military responded by increasing its surveillance of the Yellow Sea and heightened its ballistic missile defense readiness. KCNA reported Kim defended the satellite work as protecting North Korea's sovereignty, exercising its right to self-defense and elevating national prestige. On an update on the COVID crisis around the globe, we have some hopeful news as South Korea is getting its own jab label. Espen Pharmacare has confirmed that they will be able to produce up to 35 million doses monthly by June with assistance from Johnson & Johnson. South Africa's Aspen Pharmacare will supply its own branded COVID-19 vaccine to African countries by June, its chief executive said on Wednesday. The company had announced on Tuesday a deal with Johnson & Johnson, allowing it to package, sell and distribute the American group's vaccines under the Aspenovax brand. That's paved the way for Aspen to supply the shots across Africa, which has by far the lowest vaccination rates in the world. CEO Stephen Saad said the company would be in a position to provide 35 million doses per month by June. Some of those are still contracted to J&J under a previous deal agreed in November 2020. That sees Aspen package vaccine components into final vials, a process called fill and finish, and returning them to J&J. Under the new deal, Saad said Aspen would only package the vaccine and not produce the substance, which many South African health experts have said would be the next step for Aspen under its J&J partnership. The news came as Aspen reported a 37% rise in profits for the half year to December 31st. Its shares were up by around 5% on Wednesday, outpacing a 0.6% rise in the broader market index. And Saad predicts the numbers will keep going in that direction. He said Aspenovax will lead to a material jump in its revenues and profits from next year, starting July 2022. Despite this, however, Hong Kong is battling an unprecedented rise in cases and in order to fight the surge, the city is preparing for mass testing. However, the government has not confirmed a testing date. With record highs of COVID-19 cases in Hong Kong, the city's leader, Carrie Lam, announced steps to focus on elderly patients. But she did not set a date for the mass testing scheme her government has previously discussed. Hong Kong seen a surge of more than half a million infections and over 2,000 deaths, most in the last two weeks. The city has suffered the most deaths globally per million people. That's according to Our World in Data publication. 
Those deaths have climbed among unvaccinated seniors as a surge of infections sweeps through nursing homes. On Wednesday, Lamb said the government would ramp up medical treatment and set up more facilities for older patients. She gave no timing yet for the compulsory mass testing scheme, which has triggered panic buying of groceries and other essentials in the city. First of all, with regards to compulsory universal testing, it remains a project that we are making plans for. But naturally, as to when we will start this, it all depends on the development of the pandemic. We also have to consider the best timing for universal testing for it to be the most effective. But then we need to make other preparations first. Otherwise, there is still no chance for us to launch it. Her comments come after a top government official said Hong Kong had to prioritize reducing infections, severe illnesses and deaths. Residents in the Chinese-controlled territory have been confused and frustrated over contrasting messages from the government over the past two weeks and whether a city-wide lockdown would be imposed. China and Hong Kong have adopted a dynamic zero strategy. That involves eliminating infections with strict mitigation measures, as opposed to living with COVID. Medical experts from the University of Hong Kong have estimated that by the end of April, the number of people infected in the city of 7.4 million people could be about 4.3 million, with a death toll of 5,000 people. The United States may be going digital in more ways as the President Biden has signed an executive order to investigate the risk and benefits of cryptocurrency in hopes of possible, possibly creating a digital dollar for the central bank. U.S. President Joe Biden Wednesday signed an executive order requiring the government to assess the risks and benefits of cryptocurrencies and to explore the creation of a digital dollar. The president's order requires the Treasury Department, the Commerce Department, and other key agencies to prepare reports on the future of money. It's a first step toward coordinated government regulation of the now $3 trillion industry. Administration officials said oversight of the booming sector is essential to ensure U.S. national security, financial stability, and to fend off the growing threat of cybercrime. What we have today is incredibly thoughtful. Kristen Smith, executive director of the Blockchain Association, says the industry welcomes the approach. What we want is a measured, methodical approach to analyzing this space. What we don't want are rushed policies that are pushed through last minute without open discussion. And in order to get a, a menu of policy solutions to consider, you really have to start with the type of analysis that this executive order is asking for today. So I think, I think you know, the asset class is at a valuation that merits this, this, this type of investigation. Um, it's, it's not too late. Um, it's, it's also not too early. I think. White House officials said the U.S. was taking great care to decide whether and how to move forward with a U.S. central bank digital currency, or CBDC. According to the Atlantic Council, nine countries have launched central bank digital currencies, and 16 others, including China, have begun development of such digital assets, leading some in Washington to worry that the dollar could lose some of its dominance to China. Bitcoin surged on the news of the executive order, calming market fears of an immediate crackdown on cryptocurrencies. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A star-studded gala in Washington, D.C., singer and songwriter Lana Ritchie was honored with the Library of Congress Gershwin Prize of Popular Song, awarded to performers and composers of their lifetime contributions to popular music. Over 100 Indian students evacuated from war in Ukraine arrived in their home country. The students, some accompanied by their pets, arrived at an airport on northern Ghazibad city. Australia has been boosting its defence spending as China looks to step up its presence in the Indo-Pacific region. Guatemalan women's rights activist looks to the streets of Guatemala City to reject a new law that punishes abortion with up to 25 years in prison. Indonesia's Disaster Mitigation Agency said that the country's Merapi volcano erupted overnight, sending hot lava and ash down its slopes and prompting over 250 residents in the surrounding area to evacuate. 
The body of Australian cricket icon Shane Warne has been transported out of the morgue on its way to a Bangkok airport at dawn to be flown back to Australia. A coffin wrapped in the Australian flag was carried out of the morgue in Bangkok where Warne's body underwent an autopsy. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. As Rio de Janeiro's world-famous carnival holidays roll around this year without official events due to Brazil's ongoing Omicron coronavirus wave, a slew of private parties are ensuring glitter-dusted revelers will have plenty of ways to celebrate. We are leaving you tonight with visuals of colorful celebrations in Rio. Thank you for watching us again. Have a good night.